on bank GR number 170139. August 5, 2014. Samir Orvosis Placement Agency Incorporated versus Joyce Cabiles. Ponente Leonin. Petitioner Samir Overseas Placement Placement Agency Incorporated is a recruitment and placement agency. Joy was deployed to work for Taiwan Wakol on June 26, 1997. On October 15, 1997, Joy filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Commission against petitioner and Wakol. She identified Wakol as Samir Overseas Placement Agency's foreign principal. Samir Overseas Placement Agency alleged that respondent's termination was due to her inefficiency, negligence in her duties, and her failure to comply with the work requirements of foreign employer. The agency also claimed that it did not ask for a placement fee of 70,000 pesos. On July 29, 1998, the labor arbiter dismissed Joy's complaint. Joy appealed to the National Labor Relations Commission. In a resolution dated March 31, 2004, the National Labor Relations Commission declared that Joy was illegally dismissed. There was no sufficient proof to show that respondent was inefficient in her work and that she failed to comply with company requirements. Furthermore, procedural due process was not observed in terminating respondent. The National Labor Relations Commission awarded respondent only three months worth of salary in the amount of 46,080 Taiwanese dollars. The reimbursement of the 3,000 Taiwanese dollars would help from her and the attorney's fees of 300 Taiwanese dollars. The commission denied the agency's motion for reconsideration. Aggrieved by the ruling, Samir Overseas Placement Agency caused the filing of a petition for certiorari with the Court of Appeals assailing the National Labor Relations Commission's resolutions dated March 31, 2004 and July 2, 2004. The Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the National Labor Relations Commission with respect to the finding of illegal dismissal. Joy's entitlement to the equivalent of three months' worth of salary, reimbursement of withheld repatriation expense and attorney's fees. Dissatisfied, Samir Overseas Placement Agency filed this petition. Issue is the OFW's right to security of tenure. OFWs are not stripped of their right to security of tenure when they move to work in a different jurisdiction because we follow the principle of lex loci contractus. State if the right to security of tenure is applicable to overseas Filipino workers. Some mere overseas placement agency failed to show that there was just cause for causing Joyce dismissal. The employer, Wakol, also failed to accord her due process of law. Security of tenure for labor is guaranteed by our Constitution. Article 13, Section 3. Employees are not stripped of their security of tenure when they move to work in a different jurisdiction. With respect to the rights of overseas Filipino workers, we follow the principle of Lex Loci Contractus. Thus, in AAA Integrated Services Incorporated versus NLRC, this court noted, Petitioner likewise attempts to sidestep the medical certificate requirement by contending that since Osdana was working in Saudi Arabia, her employment was subject to the laws of the host country. Apparently, Petitioner hopes to make it appear that the labor laws of Saudi Arabia do not require any certification by a competent public health authority in the dismissal of employees due to illness. Again, petitioner's argument is without merit. First establishes the rule that lex loci contractus, the law of the place where the contract is made, governs in this jurisdiction. 
There is no question that the contract of employment in this case was perfected here in the Philippines. Therefore, the Labor Code, its implementing rules and regulations, and other laws affecting labor apply in this case. Furthermore, settled is the rule that the courts of the forum will not enforce any foreign claim obnoxious to the forum's public policy. Here in the Philippines, employment agreements are more than contractual in nature. The Constitution itself, in Article 13, Section 3, guarantees the special protection of workers to wit. The state shall afford full protection to labor, local and overseas, organized and unorganized, and promote full employment and equality of employment opportunities for all. It shall guarantee the rights of all workers to self-organization, collective bargaining, and negotiations, and peaceful concerted activities, including the right to strike in accordance with law. They shall be entitled to security of tenure, humane conditions of work, and a living wage. They shall also participate in policy and decision-making processes affecting their rights and benefits as may be provided by law. This public policy should be borne in mind in this case because to allow foreign employers to determine for and by themselves whether an overseas contract worker may be dismissed on the ground of illness would encourage illegal or arbitrary pre-termination of employment contracts. Even with respect to fundamental procedural rights, this court emphasized in PCL Shipping Philippines Incorporated versus NLRC. To wit, petitioners admit that they did not inform private respondent in writing of the charges against him and that they failed to conduct a formal investigation to give him opportunity to air his side. However, petitioners contend that the twin requirements of notice and hearing applies strictly only when the employment is within the Philippines and that these need not be strictly observed in cases of international maritime or overseas employment. The court does not agree. The provisions of the Constitution, as well as the Labor Code, which afford protection to labor, apply to Filipino employees, whether working within the Philippines or abroad. Moreover, the principle of lex loci contractus, the law of the place where the contract is made, governs in this jurisdiction. In the present case, it is not disputed that the contract of employment entered into by and between petitioners and private respondent was executed here in the Philippines with the approval of the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration. Hence, the Labor Code, together with its implementing rules and regulations and other laws affecting labor, apply in this case. The Twin Notice Rule In the Twin Notice Rule, the employer is required to give the charged employee at least two written notices before termination. One of the written notices must inform the employee of the particular acts that may cause his or her dismissal. The other notice must inform the employer of the employer's decision. A valid dismissal requires both a valid cause and adherence to the valid procedure of dismissal. Skippers United Pacific v. Dolza, GR No. 175558, decided February 8, 2012. The employer is required to give the charged employee at least two written notices before termination. That is, one of the written notices must inform the employee of the particular acts that may cause his or her dismissal. That is, the other notice must inform the employer, the employee of the employer's decision. That is, aside from the notice requirement, the employee must also be given an opportunity to be heard. Requisites of inefficiency. Dismissal resulting from inefficiency in work is valid provided the following must be shown. 1. The employer has set standards of conduct and worksmanship against which the employee will be judged. 2. The standards of conduct and workmanship must have been communicated to the employee and 3. 
the communication was made at a reasonable time prior to the employee's performance assessment. What is the rule on inefficiency as a just cause for termination? Petitioner's allegation that respondent was inefficient in her work and negligent in her duties may, therefore, constitute a just cause for termination under Article 282B, but only if petitioner was able to prove it, to show that dismissal resulting from inefficiency in work is valid, it must be shown that, one, the employer has set standards of conduct and workmanship against which the employee will be judged. Two, the standards of conduct and workmanship must have been communicated to the employee. And three, the communication was made at a reasonable time prior to the employee's performance assessment. This is similar to the law and jurisprudence on probationary employees, which allow termination of the employee only when there is just cause or when the probationary employee fails to qualify as a regular employee in accordance with reasonable standards made known by the employer to the employee at the time of his uh, or her engagement. Labor Code Article 281. See also Thompson's Enterprises Incorporated versus Court of Appeals GR number 192881 November 16, 2011. In this case, petitioner merely alleged that respondent failed to comply with their foreign employer's work requirements and was inefficient in her work. No evidence was shown to support such allegations. Petitioner did not even bother to specify what requirements were not met, what efficiency standards were violated, or what particular acts of respondent constituted inefficiency. There was also no showing that respondent was sufficiently informed of the standards against which her work efficiency and performance were judged. The party's conflict as to the position held by respondent showed that even the matter as basic as job title was not clear. The bare allegations of petitioner are not sufficient to support a claim that there is a just cause for termination. There is no proof that respondent was legally terminated. Issue is standards of probationary employment is applicable to regular employees. The rule which allows termination of a probationary employees for a just cause or failure to qualify as a regular employee in accordance with reasonable standards made known by the employer to the employee at the time of his or her engagement is also applicable to regular employees. State if the law and jurisprudence on probationary employees which allow termination of the employee only when there is just cause or when the probationary employee fails to qualify as a regular employee in accordance with reasonable standards made known by the employer to the employee at the time of his or her engagement is applicable to regular employees. However, we do not see why the application of that ruling should be limited to probationary employment. That rule is basic to the idea of security of tenure and due process, which are guaranteed to all employees, whether their employment is probationary or regular. The predetermined standards that the employer sets are the basis for determining the probationary employee's fitness, proprietary efficiency, and qualifications as a regular employee. Due process requires that the probationary employee be informed of such standards at the time of his or her engagement so he or she can adjust his or her character or workmanship accordingly. Proper adjustment to fit the standards upon which the employee's qualifications will be evaluated will increase the one's chances of being positively assessed for regularization by his or her employer. Assessing an employee's work performance does not stop after regularization. The employer, on a regular basis, determines if an employee is still qualified and efficient based on work standards. Based on that determination, 
and after complying with the due process requirements of notice and hearing, the employer may exercise its management prerogative of terminating the employee found unqualified. The regular employee must constantly attempt to prove to his or her employer that he or she meets all the standards for employment. This time, however, the standards to be met are set for the purpose of retaining employment or promotion. The employee cannot be expected to meet any standard of character or workmanship if such standards were not communicated to him or her. Courts should remain vigilant on allegations of the employer's failure to communicate work standards that would govern one's employment. If these are to discharge in good faith their duty to abdicate. See dissenting opinion of Justice Brion in Abbott Laboratories, Philippines versus Alcaraz, GR number 192571, July 23, 2013. Ponente Perlas Bernabe. This ponential joint, Justice Brion. Issue is due process in termination. A valid dismissal requires both a valid cause and adherence to the valid procedure of dismissal. The employer is required to give the charged employee at least two written notices before termination. One of the written notices must inform the employee of the particular acts that may cause his or her dismissal. The other notice must inform the employee of the employer's decision. Aside from the notice requirement, the employee must also be given an opportunity to be heard. What is the due process requirement in termination of an employee? Respondent's dismissal less than one year from hiring and her repatriation on the same day show not only failure on the part of petitioner to comply with the requirement of the existence of just cause for termination, they patently show that the employers did not comply with their due process requirement. A valid dismissal requires both a valid cause and adherence to the valid procedure of dismissal. Skippers United Pacific v. Doza, February 8, 2012. The employer is required to give the charged employee at least two written notices before termination, wherein one of the written notices must inform the employee of the particular act that may cause his or her dismissal, wherein the other notice must inform the employee of the employer's decision, wherein aside from the notice requirement, the employee must also be given an opportunity to be heard. Reliefs granted to illegally dismissed OFWs. The reliefs granted by law to the illegally dismissed OFWs are as follows. 1. Salary for the unexpired portion of the employment contract violated together with attorney's fees and reimbursement of amounts withheld from her salary. 2. Full reimbursement of his placement fee with interest of 12 per annum according to Section 10 of Republic Act No. 8042, otherwise known as the Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipinos Act of 1995. And 3 that repatriation of the worker and the transport of his or her personal belongings shall be the primary responsibility of the agency which recruited or deployed the worker overseas. The exception is when termination of employment is due solely to the fault of the worker. Republic Act No. 8042, Section 15. 4. 10% of the amount of withheld wages as attorney's fees when the withholding is unlawful, Article 111, Labor Code. State the reliefs granted by law to an illegally dismissed overseas Filipino worker. The reliefs are as follows. 1. Respondent Joy Cabines, having been illegally dismissed, is entitled to her salary for the unexpired portion of the employment contract that was violated together with the attorney's fees and reimbursement of amounts withheld from her salary. Section 10 of Republic Act No. 8042, otherwise known as the Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipinos Act of 1995, states that 
overseas workers who were terminated without just valid or authorized cause shall be entitled to the full reimbursement of his placement fee with interest of 12 per annum plus his salaries for the unexpired portion of his employment contract or for three months for every year of the unexpired term, whichever is less. Two, Section 15 of Republic Act Number 8042 states that repatriation of the worker and the transport of his or her personal belongings shall be the primary responsibility of the agency which recruited or deployed the worker overseas. The exception is when termination of employment is due solely to the fault of the worker. Republic Act No. 8042, Section 15, which, as we have established, is not the case. The Labor Code also entitles the employee to 10% of the amount of with withheld wages as attorney's fees when the withholding is unlawful. Constitutionality of the Restated Clause in Republic Act 10022, or for three months of every year of the unexpired term, whichever is less. The clause in paragraph 5 of Section 10 of RA Number 8024, limiting the wages that should be recovered by an illegally dismissed overseas worker, the three months is both a violation of due process and the Equal Protection Clauses of the Constitution. The subject clause creates a sublayer of discrimination among all FWs whose contract periods are for more than one year. Those who are illegally dismissed with less than one year left in their contracts shall be entitled to their salaries for the entire unexpired portion thereof, while those who are illegally dismissed with one year or more remaining in their contracts shall be covered by the reinstated clause and the monetary benefits limited their salaries for three months only. State the rule on the constitutionality of the restated clause in Republic Act 10022 or for three months for every year of the unexpired term, whichever is less. Finally, the constitutionality of the restated clause in RA 10022 was ruled in Samir Overseas Placement Agency, Incorporated versus Cabiles, GR number 170139, August 5, 2014. In Samir, the Supreme Court was confronted with a unique situation. The law passed incorporates the exact clause already declared as unconstitutional without any perceived substantial change in the circumstances. In declaring unconstitutional the reenacted provision, the Supreme Court reiterated the finding in Serrano v. Galan, Marathon, that limiting wages that should be recovered by an illegally dismissed overseas worker to three months is both a violation of due process and the equal protection clauses of the Constitution. Thus, the High Court said, We observe that the reinstated clause this time as provided in the Republic Act number 10022 violates the constitutional rights to equal protection and due process. A reasonable classification, one, must rest on substantial distinctions, two, must be germane to the purposes of the law, three, must not be limited to existing conditions only, and four, must apply equally to all members of the same class. The reinstated clause does not satisfy the requirement of reasonable classification. In Serrano, we identify the classifications made by the reinstated clause. It distinguished between fixed period overseas workers and fixed period local workers. Serrano versus Galant Maritime Services decided 2009. It also distinguished between overseas workers with employment contracts of less than one year and overseas workers with employment contracts of at least one year. Within the class of overseas workers with at least one year employment contracts, there was a distinction between those 
with at least a year left in their contracts and those with less than a year left in their contracts when they were illegally dismissed. We observed that illegally dismissed overseas workers whose employment contracts had a term of less than one year were granted the amount equivalent to the unexpired portion of their employment contracts. Meanwhile, illegally dismissed overseas workers with employment terms of at least a year were granted a cap equivalent to three months of their salary for the unexpired portions of their contracts. Observing the terminologies used in the clause, we also found that the subject clause creates a sublayer of discrimination among OFWs whose contract periods are for more than one year. Those who are illegally dismissed with less than one year left on their contracts shall be entitled to their salaries for the entire unexpired portion thereof, while those who are illegally dismissed with one year or more remaining in their contracts shall be covered by the reinstated clause and their monetary benefits limited to their salaries for three months only. We do not need strict scrutiny to conclude that these classifications do not rest on any real or substantial distinctions that would justify different treatments in terms of the computation of money claims resulting from illegal termination. Likewise, the jurisdictional and enforcement issues on overseas workers' money claims do not justify a differentiated treatment in the computation of their money claims. If anything, these issues justify an equal, if not greater, protection and assistance to overseas workers who generally are more prone to exploitation given their physical distance from our government. Putting a cap on the money claims of certain overseas workers does not increase the standard of protection afforded to them. On the other hand, foreign employers are more incentivized by the reinstated clause to enter into contracts of at least a year because it gives them more flexibility to violate our overseas workers' rights. Their liability for arbitrarily terminating overseas workers is decreased at the expense of the workers whose rights they violated. Meanwhile, these overseas workers who are impressed with an expectation of a stable job overseas for the longer contract period disregard other opportunities only to be terminated earlier. They are left with claims that are less than what others in the same situation would receive. The reinstated clause, therefore, creates a situation where the law meant to protect them makes a violation of rights easier and simply benign to the violator. As Justice Brion said in his concurring opinion in Serrano, Section 10 of RA number 8042 affects these well-laid rules and measures and in fact provides a hidden twist affecting the principal slash employer's liability. While intended as an incentive accruing to the recruitment slash manning agencies, the law, as worded, simply limits the OFW's recovery in wrongful dismissal situations. Thus, it redounds to the benefit of whoever may be liable, including the principal slash employer, the direct employer, primarily liable for the wrongful dismissal. In the sense, Section 10, read as a grant of incentives to recruitment slash money agencies, oversteps what it aims to do by effectively limiting what is otherwise the full liability of the foreign principals or employers. Section 10, in short, really operates to benefit the wrong party and allows that party, without justifiable reason, to mitigate its liability for wrongful dismissals. Because of this hidden twist, the limitation of liability under Section 10 cannot be an appropriate incentive. To borrow the term that RA number 8042 itself uses to describe the incentive it envisions 
under its purpose clause. What worsens the situation is the chosen mode of granting the incentive. Instead of a grant that to encourage greater efforts at recruitment is directly related to extra efforts undertaken, the law simply limits their liability for the wrongful dismissals of already deployed OFWs. <coughs> this is effectively a legally imposed partial condonation of their liability to OFWs, justified solely by the law's intent to encourage greater deployment efforts. Thus, the incentive, from a more practical and realistic view, is really a part of a scheme to sell a Filipino overseas labor at a bargain for purposes solely of attracting the market. The so-called incentive is rendered particularly odious by its effect on the OFWs. The benefits accruing to the recruitment mining agencies and the principals are taken from the pockets of the OFWs, to whom the full salaries for the unexpired portion of the contract rightfully belong. Thus, the principals slash employers and the recruitment mining agencies even profit from their violation of the security of tenure that an employment contract embodies. Conversely, lesser protection is afforded the OFW, not only because of the lessened recovery afforded him or her by operation of law, but also because the same lessened recovery renders a wrongful dismissal easier and less onerous to undertake the lesser cost of dismissing a Filipino will always be a consideration of a foreign employer will take into account in termination of employment decisions. See concurring opinion of Justice Brion in Serrano versus Galant Maritime Services.